In this lecture, I will briefly introduce you to the cardiovascular system where cardio means heart and vascular means blood vessels. It is also known as the circulatory system. When discussing about cardiovascular medicine, William Harvey, the father of cardiovascular medicine, deserves a special credit. Being the first person to accurately describe how blood is pumped around the body by the heart. In 1628, Harvey published his findings in Latin in a work which the title of which can be translated in English to On the Movement of the Heart and Blood in Animals. Anatomically, the heart is located in the center of the thoracic cavity incline more towards the left. And if you make a clenched fist and keep it in the center of your chest, incline more towards the left, that is how the heart is located. And the size of the heart has been described by many authors as being similar to that of a clenched fist. Here you can see the gross picture of the heart. There's a cadaver that has been exposed. So the ribs have been moved apart to expose the inside of the body, showing the heart in the center of the thoracic cavity. So here is the heart. And the heart actually is located within a pericardial sac, a structure called as the pericardial sac. And here on either side, you can see the pericardium has been removed from the heart to show the inside, that is the heart. So normally inside our body, the heart will be enclosed by this pericardial sac. And you can also see that there are great vessels arising from the heart. That's more clearly seen here in this picture. Here is the heart and from there arises the great vessels which are the pulmonary trunk and the iota. And if you see this picture here, here is the heart in the center and on either side of the heart lies the lungs, the right and the left lungs. Below the heart is the diaphragm. And this center of the thoracic cavity where the heart is located is also called as the mediastinum. There are two other main parts of the heart that you should know, which is the apex of the heart here and the base of the heart over here. So here is the apex of the heart and here lies the base of the heart. To summarize, the heart is a hollow cone-shaped organ made of muscles and is situated in the middle mediastinum in the thoracic cavity. The heart is covered by pericardium more specifically the serous layer of the pericardium and the inside of this hollow organ is lined by endocardium. The size of the heart is similar to that of a clenched fist. And the heart has four main chambers which are the right atrium, the left atrium, the right ventricle, and the left 
ventricle. The great vessels arise from the ventricles, namely the pulmonary artery that arises from the right ventricle and the iota that arises from the left ventricle. So if you see the gross anatomy of the human heart, you can see that there is the right atrium here, the left atrium here, the right ventricle and the left ventricle. You can also see the great vessels which are the pulmonary trunk and the iota. From the right ventricle arises the pulmonary trunk and from the left ventricle arises the iota. There is the right atrium, right ventricle, left atrium and the left ventricle. From the left ventricle arises the iota and from the right ventricle arises the pulmonary trunk. So in this picture you can see a clearer view of the inside of the heart with the chambers that is the right atrium, the left atrium, the right ventricle and the left ventricle. You can also see the vessels more clearly here, mainly the great vessels that is the pulmonary trunk arising from the right ventricle and also you can see the iota arising from the left ventricle. In a normal human heart, the chambers in the right side of the heart, that is the right atrium and the right ventricle, contains deoxygenated blood, whereas the chambers on the left side of the heart, that is the left atrium and the left ventricle, contains oxygenated blood. In a normal human heart, in healthy conditions, the blood on the right side and the left side of the heart do not mix with each other and it should not mix. There is a septum between the chambers of the heart that makes sure that this mixing does not occur in normal healthy conditions. So between the right and left side of the heart, there is a septum and this septum is named as interatrial septum between the two atria and as interventricular septum between the two ventricles. And the intactness of this septum in normal healthy human heart makes sure that the oxygenated and the deoxygenated blood do not mix with each other. Before discussing further about how blood is circulated by the heart, I would like you to remember these important facts. So the human body has two main blood vessels which are the veins and the arteries. The veins carry blood that are poor in oxygen and that's also called as deoxygenated blood that is the blood contains lesser concentration of oxygen. The exception to this is the pulmonary vein which contains oxygenated blood and in all cases including the pulmonary vein, the veins always carry blood towards the heart. Whereas the arteries contain blood that are rich in oxygen, 
also called as oxygenated blood with high concentration of oxygen. The exception to this again is the pulmonary circulation where the pulmonary artery carries deoxygenated blood. And in all cases, including the pulmonary artery, arteries always carry blood away from the heart. You now know that the blood from the veins are carried towards the heart and all veins except the pulmonary vein carry deoxygenated blood. You also know that the blood in the right side of the heart that is the right atrium and the right ventricle is deoxygenated. Now let's also learn how this deoxygenated blood reaches the heart. The deoxygenated blood from the veins first reach the right atrium of the heart through the vessels known as the vena cava. The deoxygenated blood, that is the venous blood from the lower part of the body reaches the right atrium of the heart through the inferior vena cava, whereas the deoxygenated blood from the upper part of the body reaches the right atrium of the heart through the superior vena cava. So the two main vessels that carry blood to the right atrium are the inferior vena cava and the superior vena cava carrying deoxygenated blood from the lower and upper part of the body to the right atrium and from the right atrium the blood is pumped into the right ventricle from where it is pumped up into the pulmonary artery and that from there it reaches the lungs there are left and right pulmonary arteries taking blood to the right and left lungs and once it reaches the lungs the deoxygenated blood gets oxygenated and the oxygenated blood now reaches the heart back again through the pulmonary veins. As you know, the left side of the heart, that is the chambers in the left side, namely the left atrium and the left ventricle contains oxygenated blood. The oxygenated blood from the lungs first reaches the left atrium of the heart through the left and right pulmonary veins. So the oxygenated blood from the right lung reaches the left atrium of the heart through the right pulmonary vein and the oxygenated blood from the left lung reaches the left atrium of the heart through the left pulmonary vein. So the pulmonary veins carry the oxygenated blood from the lungs towards the heart and it empties it into the left atrium of the heart and from the left atrium this oxygenated blood reaches the left ventricle from where it is again pumped into the iota and through the iota the blood is carried into the rest of the systemic circulation the heart also consists of valves which ensures the unidirectional flow of blood. There are four valves in a human heart, which are the right and left atrioventricular valves, the aortic valve and the pulmonary valve. The right atrioventricular valve allows the flow of blood from the right atrium to the right ventricle. The left atrioventricular valve allows the flow of blood from the left atrium to the left ventricle. The aortic valve allows 
the flow of blood from the left ventricle to the iota whereas the pulmonary valve allows the flow of blood from the right ventricle to the pulmonary artery. The valves function in such a way that the blood flows only in one direction. For example, in the case of right atrioventricular valve, once the blood flows from the right atrium to the right ventricle, the valve between the two chambers shut to make sure that the blood doesn't flow back in the opposite direction. This is how the valves function in a normal heart. The right atrioventricular valve is also called as the tricuspid valve. The left atrioventricular valve is also called as the bicuspid valve. The aortic and pulmonary valves together are also known as the semilunar valves. There's a reason why they are named so. The tricuspid valve has three cusps, bicuspid has two cusps, and the aortic and semilunar valve have cusps that are shaped like a half moon. Semilunar means half moon. So the cusps of these valves are shaped, shaped like half moon. That's why they are called as semilunar. Let's look at the picture of it here. And here you can see a clearer picture of the valves. There is the tricuspid and bicuspid valve, which are the atrioventricular valves. And uh, you can see that the valves have structures like this, which are the cusps. The cusps are the leaflets or thin, strong flaps of tissue that make up the valves. In case of the atrioventricular valve, the right one is named as the tricuspid valve and the left one is named as the bicuspid or the mitral valve. This is called as tricuspid valve because it has three cusps and the bicuspid valve is called so because it has two cusps. And here you can see the aortic and the pulmonary valves. And both of these walls again have three cusps and the cusps are shaped similar to half a moon. That's how it looks in reality but in this picture it doesn't exactly look like half a moon but actually it looks like half a moon. The cusps look like half a moon that is why they are known as semilunar walls. The semilunar walls are the aortic and the pulmonary valves. Here's the heart and you can see the right atrium, the right ventricle, the left atrium and the left ventricle. And between the right and left atrium you can see the interatrial septum between the right and the left ventricle you can see the interventricular septum and you can also see here that between the right atrium and the right ventricle there is a valve known as the tricuspid valve or the right atrioventricular valve and between the left atrium and the left ventricle there is the bicuspid or the mitral valve. To understand the function of these valves it is important to understand some anatomical features. So these muscles you see over here these are called as the papillary muscles 
and the papillary muscle arise from inside the ventricle. So as they are connected to the ventricle, whenever the ventricles contract, these muscles also contract. And one end of the papillary muscle is attached to the chordae tentinae and the chordae tentinae are in turn attached to the cusps of the tricuspid and the bicuspid valves. So that's the tricuspid valve. To that is attached the chordae tendine and one end of the chordae tendine is attached to the papillary muscles which arise from the ventricles of the heart. And whenever the ventricles contract, the papillary muscles also contract. The picture here clearly shows the structure of the papillary muscle and the chordae tendine. And here is the atrioventricular valve. Before understanding how these chordae tendine and the papillary muscle function, you have to first know what causes the opening and closing of the atrioventricular valves. Opening and closing of the atrioventricular valves are dependent only on the pressure difference between the atria and the ventricle and not on the muscles attached to them. So the factor that, that decides the opening and closing of the atrioventricular valve is the pressure difference between the atria and the ventricles. Here you have the atrium. Here's the ventricle. And between that is the atrioventricular valve. Whenever the atria contracts, there is an increase in pressure in the atrium. And this increase in pressure of the atrium causes the opening of the atrioventricular valve, pushing the blood from the atria to the ventricle. And when there is decrease in pressure in the atrium, that causes the closage of the atrioventricular valve. So the opening and closing of the atrioventricular valve is dependent mainly on the pressure difference between the atria and the ventricle. What's the function of the papillary muscle and the chordae tendine? So as you know, the papillary muscle is attached to the ventricle and when the ventricles contract, the papillary muscles also contract and when the ventricles are relaxed, the papillary muscles are also relaxed. And when the papillary muscles are relaxed, the chordae tendine that are attached to them remain in a slack or loose state. When the chordae tendine are loose, the cusps of the walls also remain in a free state or loose state. Arras. When the papillary muscles are contracted, the chordae tendine are taut or tight and this causes the leaflets or the cusps to be tight also. And this tightness in the cusps prevents them from bulging into the atria. So, because of that, there is no backward flow of blood from the ventricle to the atrium. So, when the ventricles contract, the blood only flows from the ventricle to the aorta or the pulmonary artery and not back into the atrium. So this prevents the bulging of cusps into the atrium. That's also preventing the backward flow of ventricle, ventricular blood into the atrium. To summarize, 
Valves are designed in such a way to allow flow of blood in only one direction and they passively open and close in response to the direction of the pressure differences across them. When the atria contracts, the increase in pressure in the atrium causes the AV valves to open, thus leading to movement of blood from the atria to the ventricles. And as the ventricle contracts, there is an increase in pressure in the ventricle. The pressure in the ventricle keeps increasing and it reaches a point where it is higher than that of the atrial pressure. And once the ventricular pressure is higher than the atrial pressure, the AV valves close, thus preventing further flow of blood from the atria to the ventricle. And also the AV walls close in such a way that they remain tight, preventing the bulging of the wall back into the atrium, thus also preventing the leakage of blood back into the ventricle. So the AV walls ensure that the blood flows only in one direction, that is from the atria to the ventricle. When the left atrium contracts, there is increase in pressure in the atria, causing the movement of blood from the atrium to the ventricle. And as the ventricle contracts, the pressure in the ventricle increases. And as the pressure in the ventricle is higher now than that of the atrium, this causes the AV valve to close. And then as the pressure in the ventricle rises up, it reaches a level where, there is, where it is higher than that of the aortic pressure. And when the ventricular pressure is higher than the aortic pressure, the aortic valve opens leading to flow of blood from the ventricle to the iota. And as the blood flows into the iota from the ventricle, the ventricular pressure then drops down. And as the ventricular pressure drops, The AV walls close, thus preventing further movement of blood into the iota. So here I will summarize the opening and closing of the walls. When the atrial pressure is greater than the ventricular pressure, that leads to opening of the atrioventricular walls. And when the ventricular pressure rises higher than that of the atrial pressure, the AV valves close. And this prevents backflow of blood from the ventricles to the atrium. And in addition to that, the AV valves also close tightly shut, such a way preventing the bulging of the wall back into the atrium. And all these ensure that the blood flows only in one direction, that is from the atria to the ventricle. And as the pressure in the ventricle rises to be greater than the pressure in the great arteries, that is the iota and the pulmonary trunk, so when the ventricular pressure, that is when the right ventricular pressure rises higher than that of the pulmonary artery, and the left ventricular pressure rises higher than that of the iota, then the semilunar walls open. The semilunar walls open when the ventricular pressure rises higher than that of the great arteries, that is the iota and the pulmonary trunk. And when the semilunar walls open, the blood flows from the ventricle to the 
great arteries. And as the ventricular pressure falls lower than the arterial pressure, that is when it falls lower than the pressure in the pulmonary trunk and the iota, then the semilunar valves close. And this again prevents the backflow of blood from the great arteries back into the ventricles. And one of the important anatomical aspects of the heart that helps with clinical examination is the apex beat. As you know, the apex of the heart is situated in the lowermost and most lateral part of the heart. And when you palpate the area that corresponds to this in the chest, you will be able to feel an impulse. That is the area of maximum cardiac impulse, which is known as the apex beat. And this normally is located in the left fifth intercostal space, half an inch medial to the midclavicular line. So uh, you count the intercostal spaces like this. So here's the first rib, below that is the first intercostal space, then we have the second, third, fourth, and fifth intercostal space. This is the right side and this is the left side. So on the left fifth intercostal space, you will feel the apical impulse and it is half inch medial to the midclavicular line. So this is the clavicle and somewhere here you have the midclavicular line. And half an inch medial to that, you can feel the apical impulse or the apex beat. And these are some of the important factors that we have to know related to circulation of blood. Blood flow through all organs is passive. It is not an active process, it is passive and it occurs only because the arterial pressure is kept higher than the venous pressure by the pumping action of the heart. Due to the pumping action of the heart through the iota to various vessels in the body, the arterial pressure is kept higher than that of the venous pressure and this leads to flow of blood through the organs. The pump in the right heart provides energy necessary to move blood through the pulmonary vessels to the lungs where the blood gets oxygenated and the pump in the left heart provides energy to move the blood through the systemic organs. So here you can see the right ventricle and the left ventricle. You can notice that the wall of the left ventricle is thicker than that of the right ventricle. This is a physiological adaptation because the left ventricle needs to perform greater work in pumping blood through the iota throughout the systemic circulation, whereas the right ventricle only needs to pump blood through the pulmonary artery to the lungs. As the left ventricle needs to perform greater work, it has been physiologically adapted in such a way that the walls are thicker, allowing greater contraction of the left ventricles. So, blood in the venous circulation through the superior and inferior vena cava reaches the right atrium, and this blood is deoxygenated blood. And this deoxygenated blood in the right atrium reaches the right ventricle through the tricuspid wall. And from here, it is pumped into the pulmonary arteries from where it reaches the lungs to get oxygenated. And the oxygenated blood then through the pulmonary veins of the lung, it reaches the left atrium. From the left atrium, the blood is pushed into the left ventricle through the bicuspid valve and from the left ventricle, it is pumped into the iota from where it reaches the rest of the systemic circulation. 
And one other important system you should know in the heart is the conduction system. The conduction system of the heart is responsible for generating impulses that lead to the contraction of different parts of the heart. So as you already learned, various parts of the heart contract at various time, allowing the flow of blood through the heart. And the impulse for this contraction is generated through the conduction system. So there is always an electrical event that is an impulse that precedes the contraction of the muscles of the heart. This can be better understood this way by explaining it with this analogy. That is, uh, for example, when you need to turn the fan on. So first you put, you switch on the plug and then the fan turns on and it rotates. So that action of turning the plug on is the electrical activity. And that electrical activity leads to the fan rotating, which is the mechanical activity. Similarly, in the body, before contraction of any muscle, there is an electrical activity that precedes the contraction. The electrical activity leads to the contraction of the muscle. And in the heart, the conduction system of the heart leads to generation of the electrical activity and that then causes the mechanical activity that is the contraction of the muscles of the heart. The layers of the heart wall are the epicardium, the myocardium, the endocardium and the pericardium. The epicardium is on the outer surface of the heart the myocardium is the middle layer which consists of the cardiac muscle cells that causes the contraction of the heart and the endocardium is the inner layer of the heart. In addition to that, there is a pericardium which forms the pericardial sac that is wrapped around the heart. Here is a picture of the layers of the heart wall. The outer layer is the epicardium. The middle layer is the myocardium consisting of the cardiac muscle cells. And the inner layer is the endocardium. The heart is enclosed in a pericardial sac made of pericardial layers. The pericardium close to the heart is known as the visceral pericardium and the one near that is the parietal pericardium. The space between the visceral and the parietal pericardium contains the pericardial fluid. The two main circulation in the heart are the systemic circulation and the pulmonary circulation. The pulmonary circulation is the circulation through the right side of the heart to the lungs. That is from the right atrium to the right ventricle to the lungs where the blood gets oxygenated and the systemic circulation is the circulation through the left side of the heart to the tissues of the body that is from the left atrium to the left ventricle to the iota and from where it is carried to the tissues of the body. The heart is innervated by the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nerve fibers. And the vagus nerve provides the parasympathetic innervation to the heart. The blood supply to the heart comes mainly from the coronary arteries which are wrapped around the heart. So the functions of the heart is in pumping of blood to the systemic and the pulmonary circulation and it also helps in generating blood pressure that is due to the pumping action of the heart blood is pushed into the blood vessels, which generates a lateral pressure in the blood vessel walls, forming the blood pressure. And the heart also helps in rooting blood, that is it separates the pulmonary and the systemic circulations. And it ensures one-way blood flow through the walls of the heart. 
and it also regulates the blood supply that is depending on the metabolic needs of the body there is a change in the contraction rate and force giving adequate blood supply to the organs thanks for watching i hope you found some value in this video if you did please let me know in the comments below and if you want me to cover any further topics please let me know that also in the comment section and please like share and subscribe thank you